Okay, shall we start? Okay, good. All right, so as I said, we're starting with chapter eight. And what, just to remind you what we did um, in chapter seven, chapter seven was, um, chapter seven begins um, that um, basically we said that the Lord had granted him, David, safety from all the enemies around him. They basically um, um, let him rest or or basically he was in a situation where he was in a, a position of relative peace or quiet from his enemies. And then we have this whole chapter that tells us about David asking to build the temple and God telling him he won't be able to build the temple, but he will uh, basically be the first in a dynasty that will last forever. His son, Solomon, well, he doesn't say Solomon, he says his son will take over from him and onward. Um, and at the end, of course, um, David really, it's, it's very interesting, even though the, his main request was denied, his main request to build the temple is denied, but he is really, the chapter ends with um, enormous gratitude God uh, that he has to God. He prays to God and he is uh, so grateful that um, God has basically chosen him uh, and his house to be the leader and to serve him forever. And he praises God enormously for that. Um, so that's how it ends. And I would just, um, let's see, just, I'd like to just focus on, um, on verse, if we go back to chapter seven on verse nine. Okay. So in the course of God promising to him that he will, you know, his, uh, um, <clears throat> He's, that he that his son etc will take over he says in verse nine and I have been with you wherever you went um actually in Hebrew it is and I will be with you um and it's it's kind of mixing the tenses because literally it's I will be with you um wherever wherever you went like future and past um, and I've cut down all your enemies before you. Moreover, I will give you great renown like that of the greatest men on earth. What we're going to see in this week's chapter, in chapter eight, is to a certain extent a fulfillment of this uh, assurances that God gives to David, that he will he was with him and will continue to be with him uh, in what he does. And he will give him a name. Uh giving him a great renown, and literally in Hebrew, it's to create a name, uh, a reputation. In other words, David will be well known and in a positive way, will be known and, and have a wonderful reputation. So with that in mind, let's begin reading the chapter, okay? Sometime afterward, David attacked the Philistines and subdued them, and David took Meteg Ha'ama from the Philistines. Okay, so first of all, if we remember that at the beginning of chapter seven, we have a sense that the wars are over. Now, all of a sudden, we have wars again. And also, we knew from before, before chapter seven already, um, you know, back in, in chapter um, six, I believe, or no, chapter, chapter five, uh, we see the final defeat uh, against the Philistines uh, in Jerusalem. And there we have a sense of the Philistines have retreated and they have no longer uh, posing a threat. We will also see here in this chapter different wars that happen. So the question becomes, if at the beginning of chapter seven, we have a sense that the great wars are over, what exactly are going on in chapter eight? Uh, and, and it seems that these wars are not so much wars within the basic borders of Israel, but are wars that David engages in to expand his reach, more or less to create an empire, okay? So that he goes beyond just making sure that the boundaries of Israel are secure, but that he creates a situation where the, the people of Israel are secure as a people. And there has been significant, shall we say, defeat of the enemies surrounding Israel so that they wouldn't dare to fight against Israel. And in some cases that are even under the rule of Israel, um, you know, paying taxes or whatever. So keeping that in mind, we'll continue. And it seems there, by the way, then, what is this metek amma? It is a 
a, a, a city belonging to the Philistines, again, a little beyond the normal boundaries, so that this war was to take, take control of that particular place. I guess it was a strategic place or whatever that David felt he needed to have. Now, verse 2, he moves on to the Moabites. He also defeated the Moabites. He made them lie down on the ground, and he measured them off with a cord. He measured out two lengths of cord for those who were to be put to death, and one length for those to be spared. And there are those who interpret this as meaning it's a very, very um, random kind of decision where he, he um, not just two lengths of cord and one, but basically he killed two thirds. This is after the he, he defeated the Moabites. And then when he had captured these people, let's say they were prisoners of war or something like that, he then randomly killed two thirds of them. And the Moabites, the remaining Moabites, became tributary vassals of David. Okay, so they 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 serve David. They they they're totally um, uh, subjected to David's rule, which means uh, paying um, paying uh, tribute, paying taxes, or whatever. Now, um, one of the big questions that comes up is, what does he have against the Moabites? that he should have been not just fighting the Moabites, but seeming to have such a cruel treatment of them that even after he's defeated them, he is just randomly killing two thirds of them. It doesn't, it, it doesn't really have a reason that is listed here. And here we have, it's very interesting, um, but Jewish tradition comes forward with a very interesting theory. It's uh it's a theory that makes sense, but it's certainly not something that you have to accept because it's just one theory. Um, it doesn't really say anywhere in the Bible that there was a particular problem with Moab. So it has to be based on conjecture because we do not have enough information about that. If we go back to... Um, where I wrote it down... Okay, look at 1 Samuel chapter 22. This is um, at the beginning of the time where David is fleeing from Saul. And one of the first places that he takes refuge is in Moab. Uh, so if we look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 3, David went from there to meet Spe of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, let my father and mother come and stay with you until I know what God will do for me. So we led them to the king of Moab and they stayed with him as long as David remained in the stronghold. And then we have a situation where um, the prophet God goes to David and say, don't stay here. You need to go back to Judah. And so David leaves. The assumption here is that he leaves his parents and perhaps other family members within Moab and he himself goes and continues with his with his men uh, into Judah, and then we have the rest of his uh, escapades. Now we don't know anything else about his parents. The Bible doesn't mention anything. Okay. However, I'll just show you one more scripture that is interesting. Let's go forward. Now we will discuss chapter ten, of course, in detail uh, in a couple weeks, but. Look what just look at the first verse in chapter 10, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 10. Sometime afterward, the king of Ammon died, and his son Hanun succeeded him as king. David said, I will keep faith with Hanun, son of Nahash, just as his father kept faith with me. He sent his courtiers with a message of condolence to him over his father. Okay, now. Again, there, like here, the question is, here the question is, what did Moab do so terribly to David that he feels the need to treat them so terribly? In the case of Ammon, there's the reverse. When exactly did um, Nachash, the king of Ammon, uh, be so nice and kind to David? So one of the theories there is that um, we're going back to who is Nachash, now we met Nachash in the book of in 1 Samuel at the very beginning of Saul's reign. And you may recall 
there was a group of people way in the north called Yavesh Gilad. And Nahash, the king of Ammon, is coming to uh, attack them, is threatening them. And Yavesh Gilad cries out to Saul, who had just become king, to rescue them from this imminent disaster as Nahash is about to come. And Saul indeed comes to their rescue and defeats Nahash. So one theory says, well, at the point at which David is running away from Saul, the nations surrounding Israel assume that if David, uh, that if Saul is David's enemy, then Saul's enemy will become David's ally. And we saw that relationship with the Philistines when um, David goes to Tziklag and he there is uh, the guest of Achish, the king of, of Gat, and um, there um, he receives a safe harbor with this Philistine king because the Philistine king is assuming that because the Philistines are fighting against Saul and Saul is chasing David, trying to kill him, that therefore David will be a natural ally of Achish. So using that same logic, they're saying it must be that uh, Ammon, uh, or Nahash at least, you know, felt kindly towards David. And who knows, maybe he did David some kind of uh, favor, um, you know, earlier on during that period when he's running around from, running away from um, Saul. But again, we don't know anything about that. There's no story, no, no facts that are told to us in the Bible that bear this out. So now we get to this very interesting theory that ties these two together. And this theory is as follows. There was a tradition, I guess, or I don't know if it's just a theory or based on some kind of tradition that we no longer have, um, that actually after David leaves Moab, that the king of Moab actually kills David's parents. And not only kills his parents, but he kills some of his brothers. And, and what's, what um, strengthens this idea is that Later on, and particularly in the book of Chronicles, although we have it to a certain extent at the end of 2 Samuel, we have a list of David's men, all the different officers and men that David appoints, and we have no mention of his brothers. We do have mention, of course, of Yoav. Yoav is the son of Tsruya. Tsruya is David's sister. But we know David had a lot of brothers. Remember, Samuel goes and they're all there, the seven and everything. And, um, and and we don't, and we also know that some of those brothers had been warriors in the army of Saul. So they clearly have military experience. So then the question becomes, okay, once David becomes king, the most natural thing in the world would be for him to appoint his brothers as his generals, and yet they're not mentioned. There is only one brother that is mentioned, um, and that is in the book of Chronicles. So if you want to look at Chronicles 1. Uh, chapter hmm, chapter 20, I believe. Let me just check this out. Neat. Yes, chapter 20, verse 7. No. Wait, where am I? Chapter 20, verse 7. Yes, absolutely. So this is referring to some of these wars that are, it's actually these chapters here talk about the very same wars that we're reading about in this chapter. And what do we learn here? Um, it's talk, First of all, it's, it's talking about the Philistines and other... It, it, we're, we don't have to go into the details here, but there's a mention here when he taunted Israel, Jonathan, son of David's brother, Shema, killed him. OK, and that's the only mention of one of David's brothers. One of his brothers is Shema. And there's a, a mention here. Actually, the uh, it's not the brother who's the warrior, but the son of the brother who's the warrior. So here's the theory. The theory is that the king of Moab actually killed the parents and most of the brothers. This one brother, Shema, is the only one who managed to escape, and he escapes to Ammon. 
And it is Ammon who protects him. And that when Moab goes to Ammon and asks for extradition, give me Shema, the brother of David, Ammon protects him and refuses to give him up. Again, a brilliant theory, a wonderful story, but it has no foundation in anything we know in the Bible. Is it perhaps based on some kind of a tradition that we don't no longer have? It's very possible. It could also be possible that it's just a nice story that helps put the pieces together and solve this problem, but that doesn't mean it's true. But I decided to share it with you anyway. Because why not? It's a nice, it's a nice story. Okay, anyway, let's continue reading. So anyway, that would, if indeed Moab had murdered his parents and his brothers, it certainly justifies uh, the way, uh, the fact that David now, even though he's, you know, Moab right now is not threatening Israel, but it's a reason why David is going to say now, okay, now I want to, uh, I have some scores to settle with Moab and I'm going to go out and fight him now. Okay, next. David defeated Hadad Ezer, son of Rechov, king of Soba. Now, what we're going to be doing here is talking about different um, uh, different parts of Aram. Later on in the book of Kings, we're going to see that Aram becomes a definite threat. Aram is located where Syria is today, northeast of Israel. And Aram as just just that one name, Aram is a definitely threat to, especially during the kingdom of Ahab. Uh, Aram is a big threat, but here we're going to see there's a few different Arams. So one is Tsoba, Aram Tsoba. And Tsoba is actually identified as being the city of Aleppo today in modern day uh, Syria. So at that time, we had different Aram kingdoms, and eventually they come together in one Aram. So here we're talking about one of them, Hadad Ezra, who's the king of Tsoba, and we see that David defeats him on his way to restore his monument at the Euphrates River, okay? So um, it, it, this also shows that David really does have expansionist uh, hopes because he's trying to go all the way to the Euphrates, now, we know the Euphrates is a biblical boundary, one of the boundaries that was promised to Abraham. So it's very, very possible that what David is trying to do here, now that he's reached a point of power and, and, and um, you know, the, the internal parts of Israel are in good shape, now it's time to extend the kingdom even as far as the Euphrates. David captured 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers of his force, and David hamstrung all the chariot horses except for 100, which he retained. And when the Arameans of Damascus came to the aid of King Hadad Ezer of Tsoba, so you see two different Arams, one is Damascus, one is Aleppo, which, as I said, are two different cities in, um, uh, in uh, Syria today. David struck down 22,000 of the Arameans. David stationed garrisons in Aram of Damascus, and the Arameans became tributary vassals of David. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. So we have now, we we learn of the defeat of Philistines, of Moab, and now of both Arams, okay? And the conclusion here is that the Lord gave victory, or actually the literal translation is the Lord brought salvation to David in all that he did or wherever he went. And we can see this as really a fulfillment of that original promise that we read earlier from chapter seven, uh, where God says, I will be with you and wherever you go, okay? And it's exactly the same words. Um, it's very interesting because, uh, yeah, wherever you go, and it's the same thing. I'm, I've brought you salvation wherever you, you go, that, that idea of going, which is, I think, very interesting. And it also gives a certain seal of approval that all you can say, well, why was David, why did he need to be so expansionist? Was this really important? But clearly, by with it, with this uh, kind of statement at the end of chapter of verse six, clearly God is with him on this and gives his stamp of approval to these various wars that he is fighting. Now, verse seven, uh, David took the gold shields carried by Hadad Ezra's retinue and brought them to Jerusalem and from Betach and Berotai, 
towns of Hadad Desert, King David took a vast amount of copper. Uh, it seems, by the way, the copper in those years was considered a very precious metal. Okay, rivaling gold, and therefore maybe even more precious than gold at the time. So this was a symbol not only of his success, but of his wealth. But what does he do with it? He takes it to Jerusalem. And we'll see later on the, the chapter, we have scripture telling us more about what that means when he took it to Jerusalem. When King Toi of Hamat heard that David had defeated the entire army of Hadad Ezer, Toi sent his son Yoram to King David to greet him and to congratulate him on his military victory over Hadad Ezer. For Hadad Ezer had been at war with Toi. Okay. Um, br Yoram brought him with him objects of silver, gold, and copper. So what do we have here? David has defeated these Aramites, these two different Aramite kingdoms. And he gets from them gold shields and copper. And now we have a third country, To'i. And To'i, we have again this idea, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. To'i is extremely grateful that David has defeated the Aramites because these Aramites have been persecuting him, have been fighting against him in Hamat. And therefore, he comes and seeks David with peace, but brings him, I guess as a tribute, the very same things that he got in the war. So basically, David now is 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 really being enriched with these with these precious metals, um, whether he defeats them or whether he gets them as tribute from someone that is so appreciative that he has defeated their enemies. And here we see verse 11 exactly what it means in the prior verse when it says that David brought these things to Jerusalem. King David dedicated these to the Lord, along with the other silver and gold that he dedicated from all the nations he had conquered, from Edom, Moab, and Ammon, from the Philistines and the Amalekites, and from the plunder of Hadad Ezer, son of Rehov, king of Tzobah. So when it says before he brought it to Jerusalem, not only did he bring from Jerusalem the spoils from Aram or the, the tribute that was brought to him by um, the king of Hamad, but he also, all the, the spoils that he gains from these various wars he brings to Jerusalem and he dedicates it to the Lord. And this already gives us a real understanding. If we may have wondered before, okay, he's doing these extra wars and he's trying to, to um, expand the boundaries and expand his empire. You might think this is a typical king who is looking for personal power and personal gain. The more silver and gold he can get, he's going to put it in his palaces. He's going to have beautiful jewelry that he wears and he gives to his wives. But that is absolutely not the case because all of the spoils David brings to the to Jerusalem, dedicates it to God, which means these are going to be the silver and gold, etc., that will be used by Solomon when he builds the temple. Okay, because he is now gathering the materials that will be dedicated to God, which means to build the temple. And it says a great deal about David's motivation. It's not just that God gave a seal of approval and, protect, and helped him, but that David's whole motivation is to expand the kingdom of Israel because it is the kingdom of God. He is there to pay tribute to God. He is not there to gain personal power and personal wealth. Um, David gained fame when he returned from defeating Edom in the Valley of Salt, 18,000 in all. Now, um, again, we, we, we said before in... In uh, chapter 7, when we read the verse that both the God says he is going to, um, in verse chapter 7, verse 9, God said he's going to be with him wherever he goes. But the end of that statement was that I will give you great renown or build up your name. And here we have the same thing where um, he gained fame or he built up his name. And the Hebrew is the same. In both places, it says it talks about giving David a name or building his name. And so, again, we're seeing chapter 8 being essentially a fulfillment of the promises that God made to David in chapter 7. He stationed garrisons in Edom. He stationed garrisons in all of Edom. Uh, and all the Edomites became vassals of David. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. Uh, now, there is a bit of a confusion here. Some of the time when they talk about Edom, it actually may be Aram. That's a theory because the D and the R in Hebrew look almost identical. Um, and that might be an issue of different versions and different versions in the, um, you know, there are some manuscripts of, of, uh, of the Bible that show some of them saying Aram and some Edom. So 
we can just leave that as a question because actually all the fighting we've been talking about till now is talking about Aram, Edom is further in the south. But uh, on the other hand, he talks about Edom and the Valley of Salt. If that's talking about where the Dead Sea is today, that is definitely close to where Edom was. Um, so, you know, I'll just throw that out for you. And again, the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. And this in Hebrew is exactly the same verse that we saw above in verse 6. David reigned all over Israel and David ex executed true justice among his all his people. Now, what it says in the Hebrew is that David and David was someone who did um, law, uh, no, justice and righteousness for all his people. This is uh, very interesting um, because this really echoes uh, a promise or, or a statement that God makes uh, with regard to Abraham. So if you go back to Genesis, Genesis uh, chapter 15. One second. Here we go. Okay, Genesis chapter 15, and um, okay, where is it? I did not write down. I have it in this one. Sorry about this. I always prepare everything in my Hebrew Bible, and then I end up reading in my English Bible, and so that I don't have the things I've underlined. So that's really not the wise. Um, okay, here we go. Um, hmm. Here we go. Uh, let's see. No. Oh, this is making me insane. How come I'm not finding this? Ah, I found it. Sorry. Sorry. I my mistake. Genesis 18. Okay. Genesis 18, verse 19. Okay. Reads as follows. For I have singled him out that he may instruct his children and his posterity to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right in order that the Lord may bring about for Abraham what he has promised him, okay? Now, here it says what is just and right. And in our in our verse, in uh, 2 Samuel, we have, even though the English is, is showing it differently, the Hebrew is, is almost exactly the same because it says here... Um, it says here, execute a true justice, but literally it's exactly the same thing. It is doing what is just and right or doing um, righteousness and justice. Okay. In Hebrew, it's lasot, stakat, mishpat, in both places. It's it's just, I don't know. It's like if you read this, it has to go ding, 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 ding. And you remember that this this is what God says of Abraham. Why is it that he chose Abraham? Because I know that he is going to be teaching his children to follow the Lord and to do what is just and right. And so here, in a way, by using these same words, what we're basically saying is David is indeed the true heir of Abraham. And that also, if we think about the fact that David himself is expanding the territory of the land of Israel, he is going all the way to the Euphrates. In many ways, by using this statement here in verse 15, we're saying, yes, and David did this with justice and righteousness. He is a true heir to the legacy of Abraham. When God first promised to Abraham, I will give this land to your children, what we're seeing here is David really, I mean, we already have Joshua conquering the land and we have Saul was already a king, but David more than anyone else is in a situation where we have We've, we've done it, okay? We've, we've secured the land, we have defeated the enemies, and we've expanded our reach even as far as the Euphrates. And that really is uh, the first person really who we can say, wow, we're seeing in more ways than one 
um, God's promise to Abraham being fulfilled here by David. Okay? And then we have Yoav, son of Tzruya, was commander of the army. Yehoshaphat, son of Achilud, was the recorder. Sadok, son of Achituv, and Achimelech, son of Evyatar, were priests. Sraya was scribe. Benaya, son of Yodiada, was commander of the Kretit and Pletit, and David's sons were priests. Okay, so what does this mean? First of all, Yoav is his chief of staff and will continue to be. From this moment on, every time we meet David, any military exploit he has, it will be with Yoav. Yoav is his nephew because Surya is his sister, okay? Then we have these two people who are the priests, Sadok and Evyatar. Now, we've already met Evyatar. Evyatar is the priest who escapes from Nov and has been with David since the very beginning of his flight from Saul. And now we hear for the first time of a second priest, Sadok. Now, in fact, these two people are priests. They're both from the descendants of Aaron. But, and we've discussed this a little bit before, but um, they're from two different families. If you want to take a look at this quickly, First Chronicles chapter 24. Uh, verse 3. Okay. David, Sadok of the sons of Eliezer and Achimelech of the sons of Itamar divided them into office by their tasks. Okay. Basically, we have here that it's, the chapter begins with the sons of Aaron. We know that Nadav and Abihu uh, were killed by God because they punished and he's left with Eleazar and Itamar. And David's two priests, each one is a descendant of a different one of the remaining sons of Aaron. Sadok, okay, is a descendant of Eleazar and Achimelech, the son of Itamar. What that actually means is that Sadok is not just is the son of Eleazar, he is a descendant of Pinchas, Phineas, okay? And we remember that Phineas was given a promise that he would be a, a priest forever. And yet, back in the book, uh, beginning of Samuel, we meet Eli. Eli is a priest, and Eli is told, because of the sins of his sons, and he wasn't able, he didn't prevent those sins, uh, and all the terrible things that happened in the tabernacle, Eli is then told he will know his descendants will no longer be priests. Well, it is Evyatar, uh, because Eli is from the family of Itamar, and it is Evyatar who will uh who is actually a descendant of Eli. Um what happens here? Well, and this is also something we have referred to in the past. Right now, David has two priests from both of the families. But later on, when Solomon takes over, he will send Evyatar away. And at that point, it will say that he's sending Evyatar away in fulfillment of what God said to Eli, that Eli's family will be stopped from being the priests. So it takes a very long time until Eli's family is stopped. And what we do see is the family of Tzadok continues the family of of Pinchas, who God promised already in the book of Numbers, you will have an everlasting priesthood. And just this name Sadok shows up over and over and over in the priestly families during the second temple to the point that we have a priestly group called the Sadducees. Sadducees really come from the name Sadok. Okay, so we can see that name and that lineage is lasts us through to the end of the destruction of the second temple, which of course is the end of this whole, you know, idea of the priests serving in the temple. So that that just brings you in here. Now, one more question at the very end. Who are these, the Kreti and the Pleti? Uh, here in the English, it says Cherethites and Pelethites. Um, it's different opinions. Some say that these are just different places in Israel, and these where these people came from. But in Hebrew, the Kreti uh, is... Um, is Cretim, okay, people who came from Crete, the island of Crete, and, and Plate T is associated with um, the Philistines. So basically, there is a theory here that these two people are actually not from the people of Israel, but are from these different groups, from different nations, who these as individuals line up with David 
and become loyal soldiers and loyal servants of David. And we see that also uh, some of the other people will meet later on as serving David. Here, the word, though, that's very interesting, it says they were priests, okay? And that's very strange because a real priest has to be the son of Aaron. And we already know that Sadok and, and Achimelech are, are the priests, are uh, uh, are the priests. So what is this? So suddenly these two guys who are definitely not priests, who are they? The very same story as it is recorded in the book of Chronicles, instead of saying priests, it says the leaders. Okay. And so here it is widely understood that when they say priests, they don't mean literally priests. They mean senior officers, leaders, priests, etc. cetera. Um, now the word priest actually means someone who serves uh, so basically what we're saying here, these were the those who served David closest. They were his closest advisors or whatever. And that uh, brings us to the end of that chapter. If anybody has any questions, now's the time. I have, um, I need to clarify something in my mind. Um, during Shufti, there was a lot of wars against the Moabs and the Ammon and all these, re the whole region. Is it possible that David, to have justice within the area and for the people of Israel not to always copying their neighbors, rages war to extend his borders so that peace could reign? Yeah, I think so, definitely. Um, the question we had about Moab is not why did he defeat Moab, but why was he particularly cruel uh, after he defeated them and killing two-thirds of them? Um, but yes, there's no question that he is trying to uh, solidify his reign so that he also has defeated the countries around them and turned them into non-threats, you know. So I think that's definitely true. But there is this other idea about uh, that we know from the beginning that God commands the nation when they first come into the land, and Joshua repeats this, and we see this repeated uh, earlier in, in Judges, the concern that if um, that too many nations around or within the land of Israel could prove to be a negative influence, right. yeah. especially with pagan worship. Mm -hmm. um, but that remains a problem. And we will see that because even now, David and then Solomon are both very powerful kings and they succeed in keeping whatever other nations are within. And there are some Kilo keeping their heads down. All right. They're not, they're not in a position to be of influence, but that changes rapidly. Okay. Because after Solomon, um, when, when the kingdom uh, splits, the Northern kingdom is rife with the uh, idol worship. It doesn't begin with idol worship, but it, it kind of slides into outer worship. And you have mm -hmm. to assume that, that this is external influences. Now, even Solomon, um, and here the external influences, they actually come from diplomacy. Solomon has a thousand wives. And these are not love relationships. These are diplomatic relationships, okay? And who are these wives? Princes, princesses, you know, the daughters of kings from all the area. And Bible tells us with tremendous criticism against Solomon, that there's actual idol worship going on in the in the palace. Now, many people believe it's not that Solomon himself is worshiping this, but that he turns a blind eye when all his wives can bring their idols and their their beliefs with them from wherever they came around. And and so there you see a direct connection between this idea of empire and negative influences. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because once you have diplomatic relationships and you let, whether it's the wives or the ambassadors, it, it doesn't really matter. You're bringing in these foreign influences that unfortunately are very negative for the people yeah. of Israel. Thank you. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? I, I think in the same subject area, um, there was always an antipathy, wasn't there, really, between God and Edom and Moab, because in Judges 11, you've got this contention, verse 17, about um, the Lord being cross because Edom and Moab would not give Israel succor when they were going through and to going into inhabit the land. And then when you get into 2 Chronicles 20, verse 10, um, and verse 23 onwards, you've got King Jehoshaphat standing up and saying, look, we've always had this thorn in the flesh. We've always had 
Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir against us that wouldn't let us enter the land. Finally, God, you're going to do something about this. And so yeah. I wonder that David, back in the chapter that we've read, has always had that in mind, that God knew that Edom and Moab, um, they they would not go unpunished. Uh, we've got the whole Balak incident as well, haven't we? It was just a matter of time and when was God's time. Um, and I think that might have been in 2 Chronicles 20. Doesn't Jehoshaphat smash them? Something like that. Um, so I, I think there's a, a long running feud and, and discontent there. Well, you know, the thing, there's there's no question that Ammon and Moab are problematic, but, and I'm trying to find the verse in uh, Deuteronomy, where Moses is very clear when he talks about the, the fight against the Amorite, I think. Let me just see if I can find it quickly. Yeah, here it is. Um, um well, the Amorites, until the time of the Amorites be fulfilled, that Right, right. No, but I'm not talking about that. I'm no. talking about during the same time. Um, mm, in other words, when they're entering, what Moses talks about entering the, you know, before they enter the land, which he's not part of, they conquered the whole eastern part of of um, of of the land, you know, and that's where you find. Uh, yeah, here we go. And Deuteronomy two. Um, Verse 18, the yeah. Lord spoke to me saying, you are now passing through the territory of Moab. Mm -hmm. Who are you? Then be close to the Ammonites. Do not harass them or start a fight with them. For I will not give any part of the land of the Ammonites to you as a possession. I have assigned it as a possession to the descendants of Lot. Okay. And it's the same um, rule with regard to Moab. Um and, and and the same with Edom. He's those three places, he says, you gotta go around them. You can't and but at the on the other hand, um, and you noted that in Judges, uh, where that where Jephthah refers to that whole discussion. Um, and Jephthah is basically saying, I can go after this territory of Emorite, because it used to be Moab, but then Emorite captured it. So I can go after the territory because it's now in the hands of Emirate. Had it been in the hands of Moab, I could not touch it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, Moab did not, did, you know, when Moses comes and he says to Moab and, and, and to Ammon, can you help us give us some food, give us some water, you know, or let us pass through your land. We'll pay for whatever we use. And they say, absolutely not. He, the response then is not, okay, I'm going to capture you and destroy you, but by God's, that he, they have to go around. But on the other hand, these people are punished because, like you said, they were not, they didn't help the nation of Israel the way they should have. So also here, you don't have a sense, God, David does not capture Ammon and Moab. He defeats them and turns them into vassals. Okay. Mm -hmm. But he is not just, you know, getting rid of their of their ability to live there or denying that this is their territory. He's just trying to say, okay, I'm bringing you under control now. It's time. And it could be that it really is, you know, a kind of a justice for, for what they did back then. Yeah. All right. Anyway, great seeing you all talking. And um, we will uh, meet next week, please, God, and, and start with Chapter 9, which introduces a whole new story. Uh, an interesting story. Okay. 